Good afternoon, or good at the middag. I'm going to start my introduction with a secret about myself. I actually really don't fit in here. I have no professional training in information technology. I have no degree in computer science. I don't have anything professional in my background to deal with computers in any way at all. <laughs> but I'm going to do my best with you guys today and share with you some of my personal journey and a fantastic journey on data engineering. I'm actually a geologist. <laughs> and I've been on this journey to find out how this cool thing that apparently you guys do called data engineering mixes with what I know, which is the geosciences. My name is Ashley Russell. I'm actually American, but I have lived in Norway for several years now. I live in Stavanger, on the other side of Norway. I'm here speaking on behalf of Equinor. Obviously, the logo is on the slide. Um, for those of you who are Norwegian, you probably know who we are. Those of you who are not Norwegian, we are the national energy company of Norway. And yes, our primary business is oil and gas. And if any of you are aware of the current volatile situation in Europe, we have a major duty to supply, for example, gas to the European continent right now. But times are changing. And we are also heavily investing in renewable energy and things like offshore wind um, and carbon capture. And I'll come back to a little bit of that today. Now, if you had asked me in 2015, when I joined Equinor as some 20-something-year-old, very bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, if I knew how a computer worked, I would have said no. And it's not like, OK, I wasn't born in the woods or something, right? I could work a computer. <laughs> but I took it for granted. Right? Turned it on, clicked on something, opened Excel, and everything was fine until you tried loading 5,000 rows of data into Excel. Right? <laughs> Today, I probably know more about computers than I really should in degree, with a degree in geology. Um, because I'm also a self-taught data scientist. And one of the first light bulb moments for me was when I was first learning data science, and <laughs> learning to code in Python was my gateway drug to this whole thing and reason why I'm here today. Um, but I began to automate with Python a lot of sort of boring file maintenance and data management stuff, right? Just making my job a little bit easier. And the light bulb kind of dawned on me and like, oh my gosh, like this could really revolutionize a lot of the awful data crap that we deal with. And I didn't know the word for it at the time, right? But now today we have a very nice term for this kind of concept called data engineering. Now, Equinor, <laughs> I know we have a nice booth downstairs. I suppose I can ask for you who know about our company what you might think about our digital capability or skill sets in information technology. And maybe you think about something like this. This is the, perhaps, the most heavily used software in all of Equinor. It's called SAP. <laughs> Now, I remember, okay, I remember joining Equinor, right? And having to go write my hours, my hours for the month for the first time, and opening this application, and staring dumbstruck at the screen like I've literally been transported backward in time to the year 1993. Where am I? <laughs> right? So we tend to have this perception in the computer science world of being fairly traditional, quite risk adverse um, when it comes to quote unquote information technology. Today, I hope to change your perception a little bit and introduce how we are finding our way n as a broad energy company, not just in oil and gas, but carbon capture and wind too, and by automating data flow, data corrections, and accessibility to data. So our data science applications, partnerships with technology companies like the ones that you are all representing, and that can flourish and we transform to a long-lasting, highly digital business that itself has data that can move also beyond oil and gas. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. OK, SAP does not mean everything. <laughs> we do have some key focuses in sort of the quote-unquote digital realm. Um, first is that we have a really strong commitment in Equinor to open source. We release both data openly for use, and we also release software. I'll share some links at the end of the presentation today. The second is what we would say the diamond in the crown of Equinor. This is an oil gas field called the Johannes Fedrup. Now, that's not the important part. 
The important part is that Johan Svedrup was planned for and executed as a, what we call, digital front runner. It's got some wicked cool tech. On the top side in the facility, we have everything from IoT to predictive maintenance to AR to full digital twins all happening. Now also, below the sea bottom in the subsurface, with Johan Svedrup, we also have a full subsurface team with integrated software development directly in the business. So it's a great place for us to experiment, work with a lot of data, it's a lot of sensor data here, and find new ways of working with quantities of data that we can maybe take to other places too. The last one is the one that I'm obviously really talking about today, is that we have a strong relationship with Microsoft. We are a Azure shop. And it goes just beyond providing Azure as a, you know, a cloud resource for us, but also partnering on projects, trying new things, giving us support. And this extends across not, of course, our oil and gas business, but also into new opportunities, including offshore wind and carbon capture as well. And so, for example, we uh, just last week worked together and Microsoft released the new energy data services. So, yeah. We're going to focus mostly on that last point today. Okay. We're going to be talking about a particular business area that I work in called subsurface. Now, to talk about the subsurface, we need to go back to Geology 101. And I'm sorry if any of you have not had a Geology 101 class. I promise this is going to be simple. And, I pro and it, it really is. There's only three types of rocks. Okay, that's it. We're quite easy, right? <laughs> um, and let's see how much you guys know about this rock. So, raise the hands. Three types of rocks. All those who think it's metamorphic. <laughs> okay. Anyone who thinks this is a volcanic rock? Oh man, you guys are maybe more experts than I intended. All right, how many of you think it's a sedimentary rock? <laughs> yeah, okay, wow, you guys really know your geology. <laughs> so essentially, the subsurface is made up of three, these three different kinds of rocks. That's it. I mean, of course, there's a lot of subcategories and divisions here, don't get me wrong, it's quite complex. But basically, that's it. Now, we see a lot of rocks, of course, exposed to us on the surface. You go for a walk in the park and you see a nice cliff or outcropping of rock, right, all the way to the, the high Himalaya. But for those rocks that are, for example, below our feet or below the ocean floor, we can't go directly see or feel or touch those rocks. We cannot actually say with exact certainty what they are. Now, that makes for a very interesting situation. Yeah, sedimentary. <laughs> okay, let me back up a little bit to the Equinor side. Now, we have a three-pronged strategy to become a broad energy company. That includes renewables. We're very strong in offshore wind. It includes, of course, oil and gas and low carbon. For me, in subsurface, this really points to what we call carbon capture and sequestration. We take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and we put it back into the rocks, into the subsurface, to store it long term. Now, understanding the rocks, or the composition of the subsurface, is important for all three of those things. Okay, even take a big wind turbine, right? You're putting a big offshore wind turbine in the middle of the ocean. You better know what the makeup of the rocks supporting the foundational support of that wind turbine are. So, this means we need to have a very good understanding of the subsurface. Now, how do we do that, right? Well, of course, we take samples. So, we have a couple of ways that we can take samples of the rocks in the subsurface. The first is we can drill a well. And when we drill a well, we can acquire some data within it. Very rarely do we take direct samples. We can, it's very expensive, and has a high risk of failure. So we take a lot of data within these wells by, strix, uh, by using stimuli or by proxy. Additionally, we can do something called seismic. This is essentially sound imaging, where we shoot sound waves into the layers of rock in the subsurface and record the refractions coming back. It tells us something about the different compositions of the rocks, the different types of them. They refract sound in different ways. 
We're going to look at the opposite of this situation for a minute. We're in a very different type of data acquisition world than we talk about subsurface. But imagine you're here. This is actually Nordmarka. It's just a short t bahn ride north of here in Oslo. It's a beautiful forest, many lakes, beautiful trees. You're here, you can smell the pine in your nose, the wind in your hair. It's a much more beautiful, warm day than today. But if you think about this environment, there's a lot of ways that you can directly measure what it is. You bring along your handy thermometer, you can directly measure the air temperature and the water temperature. You could walk around the lake and actually measure its circumference, right? You could even catch a fish and record the species of that fish. We are in a very different situation when we talk about trying to understand the composition of the rocks in the subsurface. Now, even more, I don't know, terrifying is that it underpins all three of our main businesses in Equinor, is understanding what the makeup of those rocks are. It is, by its own nature, a predictive business. And we're a multi-billion dollar revenue company. <laughs> so, pretty wild, right? We better get it right. No, we don't always get it right. Now, through to today, the interpretation of this collected data has been done through a lot of manual work, a lot of expertise in trying to do their best to integrate data to make a best guess of what the rocks are going to look like given a specific location. Um, so, if you're like me, if any of you are data scientists in the room, you're probably thinking, okay, this is a predictive business. Can we get better at making those predictions? Can we do it faster? Can we do it better? Can we have more handling of the possible outcomes and uncertainties? And you would be right, you know, concepts of machine learning are very applicable here, and we'll talk a bit about that. But <laughs> many of you who have worked with any type of analytics or data science will know that that only works as well as the data that they are based upon. And so it introduces our challenge today. Because the subsurface is something we cannot easily or directly measure, we take many different types of samples. Most of them are taken through various stimuli. Now, this results in a whole swarm of different kinds of data, data products, data sets, data types, whatever, you want, whatever buzzword you want to use for this. Right? But here comes the important and fun part. <laughs> Each one of these different types of data comes with their own unique file formats, physical file size, concepts of metadata, concepts of quality, um, and completely different for formats and structures. And just to point out, there's not a ton of time series data here. Yeah, we have some, but we're in a very different, more static world when we talk about subsurface data. So there's not a ton of like out of the box, like time series analysis sort of tools that we can really use here. So we decided in Equinor Subsurface, with start with improvements to just one of these. <laughs> How can we understand how to do proper modern data engineering by picking off perhaps a low-hanging fruit? Uh, we'll see if that's actually true. And so we decided to work with a type of data called wall logs. It's got a few things going for it. One, it's tabular data. Awesome. Rows and columns. We love it. We collect a ton of it. So for data science, it's a really great statistically large data set. Awesome. And third, it's one of the most heavily used types of data in the subsurface organization. If you talk to anyone, no matter their scientific background or discipline, they know and use well logs in their daily work. So we decided we start here. Now, well logging in itself, I just have to give you a little bit of information about what it actually is. It's actually really amazing technology in its own right. Now, some French guys in the Paris Basin, outside of Paris, France. You may recognize the name on that truck there. I think they're also in the expo downstairs. But these French guys in Paris Basin in, mark the year, 1927, decided to try making an electric current from inside a drilled well, through the rocks outside that well, and record the changes in conductivity or the inverse resistivity to try to understand if they could see differences in the rocks. They're looking for, remember our friend, sandstone. Now, long story short, it works very well. And with the technology advances from World War II, mostly on the atomic front, right, well logging today isn't just about electric signals, but we also use a whole variety of different stimuli to try to understand what the rocks are like along a wellbore. 
So we use things like light, we use things like neutrons, gamma rays, and we also use some mechanical measurements. But the point being, this started in 1927. That's 100 years of data acquisition of well logs. So needless to say, as you can imagine, there's a lot of legacy <laughs> contained in well log data that we as humans have had been dealing with for the past several, well, several decades to make a proper analysis. Now, traditionally, the way that this data is handled is that when we complete a well, we've hired some type of vendor, and they've done the well logging, right? So they have a much nicer boat or truck now, right? And they deliver to us a series of files. We can have a couple, or they might give us a whole bunch. It depends on what kind of acquisition program we've decided to have. Now, uh, a person essentially loads all these files into a special oil and gas software, this is the traditional method, and begins to work and make a lot of transformations within that GUI. Now these might be things like removing outliers, you know, common transformations, removing sections of bad quality, maybe they do some unit of measure transformations, some schema changes to the naming, you know, pretty conventional things. They'll also add a little bit of the special Equinor sauce into it too to do some calculations as well, to give the data a little bit more of uh, something that gives people a little more of an indication of how to use it. Now, typically this is only done for wells that are deemed important in some way. Okay, we drill a well, we don't find anything. You've sunk a lot of cost into that. We're not gonna keep working on it, right? And of course, that creates, <laughs> very nice for us data scientists, a inherently biased data set. Not only that, to make matters worse, the transformations that these folks are doing in this proprietary software are not recorded anywhere. So what happens is this person does all these transformations and they produce the master, the composite, the one file per well that everyone should use. But we have no lineage information on how that was actually created. Cool, right? You can imagine the grief and rework that this has caused us. Um, to make matters even a little bit more worse, that's a person doing a lot of transformations here. Everyone has a little different flair to how they do that, and it's changed over time. Okay. So the whole process here takes about a week or two, and if we outsource it, which we do sometimes, you're talking between 1,000 and 3,000 US dollars to do this for one well. So it's actually quite expensive. Um, obviously, herein lies the opportunity. If we can do these sort of transformations more automatically, and we don't care about which data, we can do it for any data we like. We record lineage so we know how things were done. Can we have more standardized data faster, right? With the ability to understand exactly what had created that master file. So that was the opportunity that we were talking about here. Now, I know you guys are pretty technical. What does well log data actually look like? And in reality, this master composite <laughs> looks like this on the left. It's essentially, like I said, a row and column structure with a metadata section at the top. The fun part is that this is in a standard called .las, a LAS file, which is a, a industry file. It's only in the oil and gas industry. You won't find it anywhere else, right? So that's not very great for things like Azure. Um, but essentially, Hopefully, in the metadata section, we have some aspect about what each of the columns are. We have something about the units of measure and typically some type of short descriptions. So we have a little bit of metadata to help us out. Now, on the right is what well logs look like when we actually style them. So we add some line coloring, some, some fills, and this is what a geoscientist would typically work with. So if you showed this slide, to say a general geoscientist or geologist in Equinor and ask them to pick out the well logs. They would instantly know, oh yeah, that picture on the right, those are, those are well log data, data. But it would take them quite a bit of time to understand that the picture on the left is the same data. The point being, anything we do to automate the preparation of that file, the end result needs to behave like the image on the right. Okay. Don't worry too much about this slide, just map. Equinor drills and has drilled a lot of wells worldwide. We had a lot of opportunities for data collection, put it that way. This is a pure marketing slide, capital markets update, blah, 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 M numbers don't matter. 
But the point being is that we have a variety of projects across the world. We are not just in Norway. We, of course, have a lot of focus in Norway, but that's not it. So we have data from all over, pretty much, multiple countries across the world. We also have access to publicly released data, which is nice. Most countries release their well data after a certain number of years. We can also trade with other companies, or we purchase data from an external vendor. So if we take the business opportunity I just mentioned to try to automate and standardize this sort of transformation that people are doing physically today, and taking all those many, many different files per well and turning them into the master, the composite, if you could do this globally, right? We have about 120,000 wells in-house that we have data for. Each one has about 50 well logs, 50 columns in a, each file. That means we're looking at a pretty massive count of data, which is great for data science, right? About six million well logs, or six million of those columns. Now, for any of you who work with things like MLOps or any type of machine learning model and trying to scale them from one project to another, right? You can imagine the power that this has for data science globally. You have perfectly standardized files in every geographical location for every project you are working in, right? Data science across our subsurface, projects worldwide, we can make predictions faster, more comprehensive, right? And with more probabilistic results, right? We can handle things like risk in a little bit better way. And the key point being is that we prevent the data scientists in each of those project locations from each having to do their own data wrangling of well logs. Right? Which means we can move a lot faster. You can probably guess what the next word out of my mouth is going to be. But <laughs> there are some very good reasons that we've been doing this processing of this data manually for so many years. Life is never that simple. And I think you guys know that in this audience. So there are four key challenges that we had to figure out how to engineer. And if the data was really bad, at least find some way to have good logging so that we could handle it manually. OK, I don't know. Any Brits in the audience? Anyone know where this is? This is London, the Millennium Bridge. And the first challenge revolves around units of measure. I'm sure something many of you have probably struggled with yourselves. And a little quiz for you. You can go ahead and Google it if you like. Did the United Kingdom complete its conversion to metric units? The answer is no. <laughs> There's a very long and winded article on Wikipedia about this, if you have you know, 20 minutes to read it. But I think the best way to explain it is that there exists in the UK today an advocacy group called the Active Resistance to Metrication. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It literally, this exists. Uh, a Brexit thing, I don't know. So, what this means for us doing data engineering of well log data is that the UK is extremely unpredictable in which unit measure systems that we're dealing with. And to make things even worse, we find situations where the template for the acquisition program was set up in one unit measure system in Imperial, for example, but the actual data collection was done in metric. Really fun. Now, this problem goes worldwide. The number of unit systems we deal with in well logging is actually mind-boggling. We use so many different types of measure systems because we're using a pretty wide variety of different stimuli to collect data. Um, and not only that, but as you guys are also probably aware, the way that you can spell units of measure can be very different from one place to another. So something you think as simple as inches, we found, for example, six different ways that you can write the word inches. And if the unit measure includes a symbol, of some kind, God forbid, a fraction or an exponent, <laughs> then we really have a big problem. For example, a common measurement we make in well logs is a measurement of what we call density. Density we measure, well, we want, in grams per centimeter cubed. Oh gosh, a fraction and an exponent, right? So we found 17 different ways that this can actually be spelt. <laughs> so that's challenge one. Unit to measure systems, lots of them messy. Challenge two, data formats. This is my favorite slide. So this is a very nice description at the bottom here um, from one of the standard and governing bodies for the sort of geology subsurface industry. And it's giving this statement. 
you know, we've developed new capabilities and data acquisition. We need to offer more flexibility. The result is that we've created a more efficient and powerful standard for log information recording. And we are going to call it the Digital Log Interchange Standard, or DLIS. Okay, but anyone know who this guy is? <laughs> this is the first George Bush. Welcome to the year 1991. That's when this was written. And they're not talking about some cloud-ready format or JSON or XML or anything like this, right? They're talking about a format in binary optimized for, you're going to know what's coming next, tape. <laughs> Sweet. So we don't have physical tapes anymore, but we have this DLIS format, which has essentially been extracted from these tapes. OK, so we have literally data in ancient formats that we have to handle. Next challenge, number three. Go something like this. I know, this is supposed to scare you. <laughs> Davenport's law of common information. The more important an entity is to a business, well, in this case, an entire industry, but the more important an entity is to a business, the harder it is to agree upon the name for it. Something you guys have probably also experienced. Now, this tree chart is showing the number of ways we have found to name, remember that measurement of density? This is the number of different ways we found that this well log is called. It's something called bulk density. The proper name, the standard, is R-H-O-B, rho B. Rho being the Greek letter rho, B standing for bulk. And it gives us the density to rock. It's great. For example, fern sandstone. Sandstone has a bulk density between 2 and 2.6 grams per centimeter cubed. Other rocks are different. It's not purely diagnostic. We have to combine it with other data, but it tells us something about the type of rock that we're looking at. Now, bulk density measurements were introduced in the 1950s. So we have 75 years of legacy attached to this measurement. And of course, there have been multiple vendors, slightly different technology evolution over time. We've come up with a just wide variety of names to call it the same thing. And for example, in Brazil, it's actually often found with a V instead of a B because the word for bulk in Portuguese begins with a V. So we also have language that creeps its way into this. Now, the end goal is all of these different names need to be mapped to that one single standard, RHOB. But there's more. Remember our unit of measure system for this particular measurement, grams per centimeter cubed. Yeah, right. So we also have 17 different unit of measure names that these can be in, which gives us a unique combination possibility of 3,910. And this is for one measurement type. We have 49 others. Crap. <laughs> Today, we've mapped about 200,000 of these names. I'll give you a little more details about how we do that. OK, I'm going to stop here because you're probably thinking, well, this is really crappy. <laughs> Why are you going to do any of this, right? This is a lot of work. But the answer is that, our, of course, our data science initiatives are also growing. We have a predictive business. We want to be better at prediction. So data science is a natural avenue to go. And of course, we also want more analytics. We want better data visualization. We want people to be integrating data from different disciplines better. You know, so it goes just beyond, it even goes beyond machine learning and data science, but really about making sure that data is more easily accessed and usable. OK, so main problem, though. Our well log data is a disaster, <laughs> right? It's pretty much unusable in any of these aspects. And in summary, the three main challenges, right? We got wild data formats, a lot of things optimized for tape and binary. We've got crazy unit measure systems and lots of spelling differences. And the naming of our different measurements and naming of different well logs have thousands of unique permutations. Now, Additionally, we also had some Equinor proprietary transformations we wanted to add in here. I'm not going to talk about that today. But the next part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about how we actually solved some of these. But remember, there was four challenges. I've only mentioned three. There's one last one that kind of wraps all of these together. And it comes down to performance and the ability to make any of these transformations specifically 
converting and handling unit and measure systems, and number two, being able to transform with some of the special Equinor things we want to do to this data. Okay, to illustrate challenge number four, we're gonna go for a little walk, a mental walk. We're not actually gonna go for a walk. A little sightseeing tour of Oslo. And we're gonna start our walk from the Astrup Ferne Museum in Åkerbrygge. It's a beautiful contemporary arts museum. If you haven't had a chance to just walk over to Åkerbrygge, I highly recommend it. It's beautiful architecture. Now we're gonna walk north. We're gonna go past the Royal Palace, past the castle, and up through some of the nice residential neighborhoods in Oslo. And we're gonna find ourselves at Ullevål Stadion, which is the home of the national football pitch for Norway. This is about a five kilometer walk. Yeah, okay, I think we can all probably walk that. Um, and this would be about the same length that we acquire well log data for in a well, five kilometers. Okay, not so bad, right? But on your walk, you would need to take a sample every 15 centimeters. And that is the density that we take well log samples in a well. So you can do the math. <laughs> we needed to find a way to read, convert, and do transformations simultaneously over about 300,000 rows of data per well. If you multiply that by the number of wells that we're looking at, 120,000, you are looking at a way of working with 180 billion samples. That's the end member, right? Okay, I know, that's the end member. I'm being, uh, I'm being quite bold. But even on <laughs> just the Norwegian continental shelf, right, we're talking about 300 million samples. And here's the kicker. This has to be cheap to process. We're in a business asset. We cannot be spending money on something that is, yeah, we have to be very cost control. I'm talking a little bit about this. So it's got to be cheap. Okay, so yeah, we had some problems. <laughs> um, not 99 problems, I'm sorry for the dated reference, um, but more like 200,001. <laughs> Fairly extreme, unstandardized data, yeah, check, okay. But also lots of it, double check. So what did we do to try to solve these challenges? Now there have been some great talks already at NDC about the power of a good team, right? And that was really what we wanted to begin with. So we got our really first subsurface data engineering team together and consisting of cloud architecture, data engineers, some folks with data management background, folks with data science background, and also remember that person doing that manual process with that data and that software? Oh yeah, they're in this team too. <laughs> and adding onto it the agile pieces, right? A product owner and a fantastic team facilitator who's actually in the audience, so he knows I'm not lying. And importantly, this team had ownership to these challenges, right? A lot of trust in all of our skill sets to find the right solutions and trust and fail on things. Oh, we failed on so much stuff, right? Um, and we had a lot of autonomy, which was awesome. But the important, thing, the important point being is that the team was working day to day in combination across people who knew the business, knew the data, and knew what also the potential new uses of that data were, meaning the data science side, working hand in hand with those who could translate those ideas into what we could do with cloud services and Python and development, right? Awesome, brilliant. Okay, let's go deal with those tapes. <laughs> For this, we actually contracted an independent small software um, developer team in Equinor who was really good at developing open source packages. We decided this we want to go open source with. This shouldn't limit anybody being able to read this type of file format. And the best part of this is that the main data engineering team that I just spoke about, right, they could quickly test and give feedback to that smaller team creating the open source package simultaneously, right? It works really well. Plus that small team got the community engagement as they put things into alpha and to beta, right? It's a small community, I will admit that. <laughs> We also reused from the open source community who had some other parsers that we needed. There's about seven different formats that well log data can come in. Two are binary, five are not binary. So we're able to reuse also some other packages that others have put out. So with our set of parsers, we chose ultimately to crack everything out into Parquet. We knew we were going to be doing a lot of simultaneous processing due to the density of data. We went with Parquet. Okay, where to start is perhaps one of the things that gets teams really spinning and confused. This is a complex problem spanning 
spanning the world, literally. Where do you begin? Any guess what the years are up on the screen for these countries? These are the years when the first oil or gas discovery was made in that country, and essentially the birth of the energy industry began. Now, <laughs> I don't know, but my therapist tells me, the more baggage we have, generally the harder it is to deal with it. <laughs> and if you look at Norway, 1969, relatively quite late, actually, quite, quite late arrival to the game. So we can make a very good assumption that actually by narrowing the scope to start in Norway, it makes sense on other reasons, of course, too, but from a data perspective, we're closer to the arrival of computers, one, okay, that should help us. There should be some pre-established standards from these other people who have come before, or at least have worked out some things themselves, okay, two. And also, it's a relatively short time for tons of derivations to be created in those files. Okay. Uh, of course, obviously, we were in Norway, so yeah, it made sense here to start. And we, what we found is that by solving the majority of our unit of measure issues, naming issues, by solving the majority of them here in Norway, we were actually take about, able to take about 60 to 70% of that to other countries. All right. so. I want to dive a little bit deeper into this because to just focus on Norway as a country was not good enough. The complexity was still too high. So we needed to use the crappy data we had or the raw data we have, unstandardized data. It's valuable, let's be honest. But we needed to use the unstandardized data itself to indicate to us where to focus our efforts as a team. And it came down to actually creating inventories along with our parsers. I asked many, many times, how large is this particular, how large, statistically large, tell me the, stat the stats, how large is this particular unit of measure or naming problem? Don't just give me a feeling, give me the evidence. And that's what this graph is showing. And this is just from Power BI, right? We're just using basic dashboarding to illustrate some of these. And what you're seeing are those 288, the tree chart you guys saw later, or earlier, those are the, the names along the bottom on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is the occurrence of that name in our files. So it makes sense, right, to actually start and say, okay, these names, these top 10 names, let's make sure we can map these to a standard, and we start here. But you'll also notice that the color bars on this are indicating the different unit of measure systems in these files. And you see that that is actually the bigger issue to solve first. Because the most highly occurring naming conventions will always have a variety of unit measure systems. Right? That was the biggest problem was really everything on the side, on the left side of that line. Now, we would do this for every new country we moved into. How, how wild, essentially, is the unstandardization here? And let's visualize that. Now, this is also important because the sort of knowledge of these names and unit measure systems were often with the teams who were familiar with that country's particular data. So, it was much easier to work with them to show them, okay, these are the top 30 we see in your project. Can you map these to a standard for us? If you had given them a list of 10,000, right, they would have looked at you and said, no way, go away, like, leave us alone, right? All right. Another solution for us is really iteration over technology. I would be honest and call this yeah, also failing at technology <laughs> and trying something different, um, but you can put it in both ways. And we really started with some small Python code. We had those built-in mapping lists, right, that took all those 288 names and mapped them to our friend, R, you know, RHOB, and we could run it on just one small sector of Norway. We would run it, I've heard this multiple times today, actually, we would run it on someone's laptop, <laughs> Right? And it would take a couple weeks or so to process about a thousand wells. The business was super excited about this though, because that was longer. Remember, it wanted two weeks for one well. So they were quite excited about this. Say, hey, this is awesome. But still, they're like, this is still too long. You can't leave something running for three weeks on somebody's laptop, right? That's just not practical. But it gave us the emphasis to move, okay, let's move this over to cloud. So simultaneously, by moving this sort of uh, Python pipeline, you can call it at this point, to, uh, to Azure, 
We also started moving to other countries outside Norway. That meant we had to separate those mappings of sort of standardization out of the code, right? And we needed to get them into GitHub so we could properly version control them and also set up these dashboards on top. And the Python code itself was then packaged up to run on an Azure machine using Kubernetes. And this was a local Equinor deployment of Kubernetes, but we struggled due to the density of data. It was hard to know where and in which file and which sample and in which transformation step that the data errors were coming up, and we struggled with restarting workers after airing out. Additionally, we had little cost control over the runtime expenses, which on the business side, as I mentioned, we'd be constantly vigilant over. So we decided to work with Microsoft, and with support from their cloud expertise, we were able to deploy Azure Durable Functions for Python while it was still in preview. And that was awesome. <laughs> it gave us full control how we split up the processing to different machines, and we combined it with the application's insight services, which is awesome for lo uh, logging errors, so we could understand exactly if we ran into a problem, where it was coming from. And so this uh, helped us to automatically handle derivations, which gave us the ability to actually code in you know, edge cases as we found them, um, and really improve the data quality. Now today, our, this whole process, uh, I'm going to show you in a moment, is run on a Zero Data Factory pipeline. It's an on-demand. We're not dealing with real-time data here, so we just run it when we need to. And I have a special guest to give some details on this in a moment. And we are continuing to iterate over technology. So for example, we're going to be beginning to move this pipeline onto the Microsoft Energy Data Services. But the point is, start small. And I've seen this from many of you guys today. Start small and iterate and iterate and iterate. You're going to fail. Something's not going to work. What's the next step? All right. I want to dive now into the actual data engineering pipeline we have set up on Azure for handling both unit of measure, naming conventions. But we need to talk a little bit about, <laughs> well, running this pipeline with well log files, it's a bit like a box of chocolates. You guys know the quote, right, from Forrest Gump. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry, <laughs> but it, it, it fits really well. We're dealing with highly variable input data. We're not under any extreme time pressure, right? Like I said, we're not dealing with a real-time situation here. We're not under any pressure for time in processing. So the team came up with a very clever concept to deal with the fact that some wells just were way worse than others. Some of them were way more unstandardized than others, meaning that some of them just required a lot more processing than, than some of the other ones. So like the box of chocolates, right? You open it up and you say, oh man, this dark chocolate looking one, I bet this is a really good chocolate truffle, right? And then you actually put it in your mouth and it's like the super sticky hard caramel that takes you 20 minutes to chew, right? <laughs> we don't know what we're gonna get when something comes into this pipeline. So we have to be quite clever. So we have highly variable, dense data with need for multiple transformations. And that's essentially what our pipeline does today. So I promised a special guest, and I'm going to hand it over to the data engineer from the team, Magnus Carlson, to actually describe today's Azure data pipeline. Thank you, Ashley. Hi, NDC. My name is Magnus. I work as a data engineer in Equinor. I hope you all enjoy the conference and get boosted with energy and ideas for your projects. As Ashley explained, we do have a lot of well log files in different formats. How to process them? We use Azure Data Lake, Azure Data Factory, together with Azure Durable Functions to achieve this. Because of auto scaling of these resources, it will be cost effective. In this data factory pipeline, we run multiple wells at once. First, we make all raw files into one common and reusable format with a combination of JSON and Parquet files. All of this happens in the log extraction step that starts an asynchronously running durable function. After this, we continuously pull the durable function status until it completes. Then we get the information from, the durable, from a durable entity that had gathered useful folder and well information from the log extraction step. At last, we kick off the composite creation durable function that will produce our final output, our composite well logs for the processed wells. 
this is all for me. Back to you, Ashley. Yeah, so thanks, Magnus. It was really nice for him to do this for me because I'm not going to try to explain everything in data engineering. Again, I'm a geologist. But the final products, the important part, right? The final products include the single parquet file, which contained the master, the composite well log, right? It also contains a corresponding JSON file, which documents every step that went into the creation of that master file. Awesome, now we have full lineage. We know if we've done a unit measure conversion, so for example, right? And we also produce a file that is in the correct format for our older oil and gas softwares. So we also have the ability at this point to run a quality check against the previously man-made master files to get an understanding of quantification of how good are we in our engineering pipeline against what a human does in one to two weeks. It may not look like much in terms of a data pipeline, but I think it's beautiful. We've been able to take a ton of complexity and boil it down to this, right? And to me, that is quite impressive. Oh, yeah. Okay, so what do the results look like? Now, each of these orange dots represents a well. Each one of these, it's about 35,000 that we actually care about right now in Equinor. We're able to produce one of these standardized master composites for. And a few more numbers for you. We dig through fairly unorganized loose files in our Azure data lake. We dig through about 17 million files looking for these particular well log data. So that represents about a 485% reduction in the amount of data digging that, for example, a data scientist would have to do. And the pipeline handles that for us, right? We also receive about 1,000 or so new well data sets per year globally, so we can quickly on demand run this pipeline, right? and produce those standardized outputs. And of course, our machine learning engineers or data scientists can quickly put that right in because it's in the same schema. Ha, huh, great. Plus, if we decide we do need to make a schema change to either naming conventions or unit and measure systems, there's only one place we have to do it, right? Which is in this pipeline, and we can rerun all of the outputs. But the capability to mix and match the data from certain countries, right? for different rock types, different types of rocks in different places in the world, and different situations. It's an ML training data dream, right? This is a lot of really good statistical data. Also, and we, we publish actually papers on some of our machine learning models on this, but we've supplemented statistics from one part of the world to be able to support uh, a project or a prediction case in, for example, Norway, right? where sometimes we need a little bit more boost. We have similar rocks, for example, in Australia. We can take the files from Australia to help support a machine learning model that we're running for an application in Norway. Additionally, as I mentioned, this works very well because no matter where we work in the world, we have access to the exact same data. Now, the pipeline costs about four Norwegian kroner for a well. It's about 40 cents <laughs> for which is extremely cheap if you remember how much we pay, between $1,000 and $3,000. And if we rerun anything, it's about $140,000 NOC, um, which is approximate price we pay today for just six wells. And it's pretty darn fast, right? It's about three minutes on average per well, and that's, though, quite a lot of standard deviation on that because we do have some files that take a really long time to process, but on average, about three minutes. Okay, but it's not just about numbers. I think I really want to mention that too. This was really a first foray for us into data engineering on subsurface data, and it's affected a couple other things, right? Um, it was a big learning process, so it's also affected how we look at our data vendors and our contracts, right? Um, data comes, for us, comes from someone. Someone goes and collects it, and we usually hire and pay for that service, right? And so for us, it tells us, okay, there's a lot of value in sharing that our vendors are using right standardization, that the formats they're providing to us are machine readable and properly filled in with right metadata with high quality, right? And they're all using the same types of units and measure systems, right? Additionally, <laughs> this is one of the first teams that we had ever assembled to do this type of you know, cross-domain data engineering, where you have the business people and sort of your, your computer scientists working together. And that was really brilliant. The mixture of the business knowledge of the data, but also cloud systems architecture, APIs, cloud services, all these things, combined with how data science wants to work. So it's that mixture of the traditional, the new, and the sort of yeah, computer science 
uh, knowledge that really made us capable of handling all of those challenges. Finally, um, just one last number. I know I don't really like numbers, <laughs> but value realization. I need to mention that automation is a pretty scary word in a traditional business. And starting with a simple thing, a seemingly simple thing like this, standardization of data is something that people take a little bit easier. It doesn't say, oh, we're not, I'm not going to lose my job here. You're actually automating the really crappy things that I don't want to deal with, right? So this was a really big um, sort of input in sort of the culture, that sort of automating and working with things that are maybe not so scary is one way to really introduce new technology into a more traditional company. And in our case, we also demonstrate a massive upside. If you were going to produce these master composites for every one of our wells to prepare for some sort of data science application, it would take 253 man years. Basically, we would never do it, right? All right, I'm almost done. I hope over the past hour-ish, 52 minutes, maybe I've changed your mind a little bit as to how Equinor is approaching data and software. Yes, I still have to do that deal with SAP. I actually did my time writing this morning on it, and it sucks as usual. But my days have a pretty equal balance now of the Azure portal, which makes me feel a little bit cooler as a geologist. Now, where do we go from here? I'd like to say, put a ribbon on it, pack it up, we're done. <laughs> but in truth, we have a very long way to go. In subsurface, we have a massive data footprint. And the new energy chains that we're working with, offshore wind and carbon capture, they want to reuse the decades of data that we have in-house, right? So I've told you the story now for just one of these data types. <laughs> There's a lot more to go. <laughs> so the main point being that we need to continue with good partners and good teams, right? Both computer scientists and IT professionals like many of you in this room working together with folks like me. So thanks for listening today. If you want to check out some of Equinor's open data sets, including things about rocks and subsurface, you can find that at data.equinor.com. And you can also check out our open source software offerings. Thanks, all. You can catch me at the Equinor booth if you have any questions. So yeah.